<laughs> um, Pastor Peck asked me to uh, preach tonight. I felt it was a little odd that he asked the, uh, the guy who's been outside of the U.S. for the last eight July 4th to come up and preach on July 3rd. But here goes. So I know we're in a military town and we're very patriotic, so this may not seem overly patriotic to you, but since I've been outside the country, it's pretty, it's pretty patriotic, at least in my opinion. Um, so let's go ahead and open up to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to love our country. He wants us to love uh, our nation. He wants us to want the best for our country. He wants us to pray for our leaders. He wants us to be thankful for where we were born. And he wants us to be a good citizen. Um, he wants us to follow the laws unless they, unless they don't follow him. First uh, Peter t- chapter two verse seventeen says, "Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king." Okay, we are to honor our country, and we are to honor the leaders of our country, even if we don't necessarily agree with them. Because God put them there. However, there is such a thing as too much patriotism. If country comes before God, then we've loved our country too much. The Bible illustrates that through a man. His name is Jonah. And we're very familiar with Jonah, but we may not be, we may not always think about all that it has to say for us. Okay? So if we look at Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare therefore, thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So Noah chose, or Jonah chose to go the exact opposite direction that he was told by the Lord to go. Okay? He chose not to go speak to the people of Nineveh. And in Jonah chapter 4, okay, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah tells us why. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I know that thou art a gracious God, and a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah did not want the people of Nineveh to repent and have mercy. He didn't want that at all. And we can look at why. He has reasons, and they are valid reasons. Okay? The people of Nineveh were very wicked. Let's see if it goes to the next slide or not. Okay. Uh, Nahum, who also preached against Nineveh, he shows us that. He's got it in Nahum chapter 1, 
verses 9 through 11. Okay. Nahum chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one, one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Okay? So first of all, uh, Nineveh had at least one counselor in there whose only goal was to fight against the Lord. Okay? That says right here in verse number 11, that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So there was someone in Nineveh, an authority type figure, who was directly against God. Okay? But not only that, we look down at verse 14, uh, and the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thee grave, for thou art vile. Okay? God called Nineveh a vile city. And vile is a pretty strong word when used against an individual. It's talking about someone who is extremely wicked extremely evil, okay? And yet again, in Nahum, the same book, if we go to chapter number 3, verse number 1, Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not, okay? Nineveh was a city that was bloody. It killed people. The country of Assyria every year would go out and attack other countries and bring back people, torture them, murder them. It was an absolutely horrible place. Okay? And then the last verse of the book, there is no healing of thy bruise, thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Everyone knew how bad Assyria and Nineveh were. Everybody. Okay? All the nations around had suffered because of their brutality and their wickedness. And it's not just, uh, it's not just the Bible that mentions this. Uh, Assyria's own archaeology, archaeological records paint a pretty ugly picture of their civilization. Uh, it includes things like impaled bodies, dismembered bodies left on their walls as warnings for other countries, and many, many worse. And if you're curious, I would suggest you do not look it up, because <laughs> it's, not, it's not a pretty picture. And it's possible that they were exaggerating somewhat, but what it does say is if that is what they're glorifying, they were a very wicked people extremely wicked, and deserving of God's judgment. Okay? Jonah was told to go to Nineveh because God was going to judge them. They deserved it. And Jonah knew it. Okay? Not only were they evil, nope, but they were also Israel's enemy. Now, at this point, they had not had any major conflicts with Israel, although later on, Assyria is actually the nation that conquers Israel. Okay? But they were the world power at this time. They were known all over the world. They were conquering nations, and every year they had, uh, Assyria had a thing that said, this guy reigned, he attacked there. This guy reigned, he attacked there. As a yearly thing. Okay? And so they were a threat to everyone around them. And they were very obviously Israel's enemy. So it makes sense. It makes sense why Jonah would not like them. They're cruel. They torture. They murder. They conquer. And they're the strongest country around. Okay? 
the USA has enemies too. Being in our position as the strongest nation in the world for an extensive period of time has made some pretty strong enemies for us. There are countries that want to see us fall and want to see us destroyed. Russia, China, North Korea, Iraq, and others, they want to see America's downfall. Jonah did not want to see the Ninevites saved because they were evil and wicked and they were the enemies of Israel. They did horrible things to their prisoners. Whatever you think of that countries do today, Nineveh did it worse. Okay? And Jonah did not want them saved. Are we the same way? Do we have a Nineveh that we want to see fall? Maybe it's a country. Maybe it's a city. Maybe it's a politician. Right? Is there a Nineveh that we don't want to see saved or rescued? Okay? Now, we would, never, we would never act like Jonah. We've read about him many times. We know that Jonah was wrong. Okay? So we're not going to run to another country to avoid doing what God wants us to do. However, within our hearts, are we perhaps wishing for the downfall of certain places, certain individuals? Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, verses 17 and 18. Proverbs 24, verses 17 and 18. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and not, let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Right? The Bible tells us not to rejoice at the destruction of our enemies. That that displeases the Lord. Okay? While we may not ever obviously do it like Jonah, well, the Lord can look into our hearts and he can see what we think and what we rejoice at. And it displeases him for us to rejoice at the downfall of other people. Jonah, and we all, we all know that he hated Nineveh and the Assyrians. But as a counterpoint, I do want to make this note before we move on. Jonah was mistaken. He saw Assyria and Nineveh as wicked and evil, and they were. He was wrong, though, in that he thought that the Israelites were good. Prior to Jonah's time, there had been about 11 kings since the split of the northern and southern kingdoms. And all of those kings, the Bible records, were evil. The Bible reads something along the lines of, and so-and-so began to reign over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not a single one of those kings of Israel was listed as doing good. And not only were they listed as doing evil, they got progressively worse. If we go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, and you look there, you have the king Omri, and it says with, of him, he did evil above all that were before him. Okay. When you get to his son Ahab, which we're all very familiar with Ahab, 
It says the same thing about Ahab. He did evil above all those that were before him. And if you go to the end of 1 Kings and read about Ahab's son, Ahaziah, it says he was just as evil as his father. Okay? Israel's problem wasn't Assyria. Israel's problem was Israel. Israel's enemy was not Assyria. Israel's enemy was Israel. Okay? Israel, Israel's problems, the times they were conquered, the times they were defeated, every single time was because God was judging them for their sin. If you look at the book of Judges, it was a, a circular spiral where they, they were doing good, they started sinning, they did bad, God judged them, they repented, and they did, were doing good, and it was just a big circle over and over and over of the Israelites' sin causing their own downfall. It wasn't Assyria causing Israel's downfall. Because God is stronger than Assyria. It was Israel. Israel was causing their own downfall. I think that we can draw a lot of parallels with this to our own country. America is wicked. You know, we look at nations in the Bible sacrificing children to gods, and we think, wow, how could they ever do that? But with abortion, we're sacrificing children to gods, too, the gods of pleasure and convenience. We do the same things that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah for. We're doing them and celebrating them today. We rebel against God just as Israel did. America's greatest enemy is not Russia or China or Iraq. It's America. And if anyone's going to bring our downfall, it's going to be ourselves. Continuing on with Jonah, though, we all know what happened with the whale. Uh, you know, it's a very famous story. Jonah did end up returning and doing what the Lord uh, wanted him to do, albeit very begrudgingly. Uh, there was definitely no uh, compassion with Jonah, but he did end up obeying the Lord, and the Lord brought about great repentance in Nineveh. Uh, chapter 3 is actually all about that. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Rise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. I don't think he had a lot of bullet points to his sermon. <laughs> but it was effective. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil 
that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So if, if they were so wicked, then why, why did God repent of the evil planned towards them? Okay, <clears throat> let's take a look at the end of the chapter, verses 9 through 11. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? Chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Six score thousand, that puts us at 120,000 people. That's a lot of people that Jonah was ready to just let perish. But God loved them. Okay? God had empathy towards them. Okay? God wanted to see them repent. Give you some numbers here. Russia has 144 million people. North Korea has 26 million people. Iraq has 44 million people. And China has 1.4 billion people. Okay. China has double the population of the entirety of North America and South America combined in that one country. If God cared for a city of 120,000, do you think he might care for a country of 144 million? Or a country of 26 million? God cares greatly about the people of North Korea. We tend to write them off because their leader is someone special. But God cares greatly about them. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants to see every person come to him. The purpose for Jesus to come to earth was to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Every nation, every city, every person. That includes people that we consider unredeemable. That includes the leader of the nation of Russia, Vladimir Putin. God died for him. That includes the leader of the nation of China, Xi Jinping. God died for him as well. It includes the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Yep, he's in the list as well. It includes Joseph Biden and Donald Trump. It even includes names like Adolf Hitler and Judas Iscariot. Jesus died for everyone, not just the people we think are good, but for the people that we think are unredeemable. You know, Jesus even died for the people that put him on the cross. We look at Luke chapter 23. Verses 33 and 34. Luke 23, 33 and 34. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. 
and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Jesus died for his torturers, his accusers, and the people who murdered him. I wish, I wish that we had that level of love. Most of the time we don't. Most of the time we get angry at people who cut us off in traffic and hope they, they have a crash further up the road because it's because they did so mean things to us. But how many times when someone's cut us off in traffic have we said, Lord, please save that person? I don't know that I've ever done it. I don't think I have. <clears throat> While preparing this, I was thinking about a fairly prominent politician in the US that is one of those politicians that have been there forever and do nothing good and get rich off the people, of which there are many. But it occurred to me that though I had complained about this person, made fun of this person, I had never actually prayed for their salvation. You know, America has a lot of politicians, a lot of leaders of our country how many of them do we pray for their salvation? If I look at my own life, very few. You know, if our Nineveh is a person, God died for that person. If our Nineveh is a city, God wants to see the people of that city repent. If our Nineveh is a country, God wants to see revival come to that country. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. God died for them. And the, the next point is the one that might get me in trouble. <laughs> As an American, I, I, don't, I don't like this particular thing. Grinds my gears, but it is the truth. Okay? God is not on America's side. He never has been. Okay? God chose one country, He chose Israel. He's never chosen another. Okay? Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, verses 13 through 17. Isaiah 40, 13 through 17. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him, uh, showed, sorry, and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Okay? The question has never been, is God on America's side? The question is, is America on God's side? Are we standing with God? Because God hasn't moved. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. So are we standing with him or not? Okay. 
Actually, even, even Joshua got this particular thing wrong. If we look in Joshua chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, Joshua 5, 13 through 15, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the hosts of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua assumed that his side was the correct side. He assumed that they were the good guys, the other side was the bad guys, and God was on their side. And God had to correct him and say, nope, you need to be on my side, Joshua. not the other way around. I, I know that God never chose America, but I do believe that at least in its founding, America chose God. Okay? Now, a lot of people are trying to argue that that's not the case nowadays with the rewriting of history and things. But I believe that America chose God upon its founding. And I think we have evidence in that because God has greatly blessed our nation. We went from a couple of colonies to being the head of the world for a very long time. And that was a great blessing of the Lord. And we've been able to send missionaries all over the world to places like China and places like Thailand and places like Indonesia, places like Japan, most of the countries of Africa, if not all, we've been able to send missionaries. God has greatly blessed our nation because our nation chose him. But if we were to look at our nation today, could you say our nation is choosing the Lord? I don't think I could. We are called a Christian nation by the nations around us. But from what I see, we are not. We are the leaders of the world in celebrating homosexuality. Thailand, where I was for four years, takes their cue from us on that. China... You know, communist China is fighting that influence from us. We are encouraging Chinese people to embrace homosexuality. And the Chinese government has to fight back because of us. We must not mistake God's blessing on our country with his choosing of our country. Okay? God pronounced judgment on countries all throughout the Bible, including Israel, which he chose. And I believe that America is asking for God's judgment. Now, the Bible's fully written, so we're not going to get a book on it. But I believe it's coming. So if we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, it might take on a little bit of a different meaning. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made 
for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may live, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Praying for the leaders of our country is not just praying for our own benefit, it's praying for theirs, and it's praying for our country's benefit. I think the salvation of Joe Biden would change things. I think the salvation of all sorts of people in our government would change things. We probably have less fighting in Congress and we might actually see some laws that are right being put on the books. Because when you are saved, you look at the world differently. So let's look at our reasons for praying for Nineveh. Go to Matthew, chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. Verses 43 and 44. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So the first reason we should be praying for our Nineveh, for our enemies, for the people we hate the most, is because Jesus told us to. He directly told us to do that. And he told us to love our enemies and to pray for them. That is his direction towards us. And he gave us an example because as we saw in Luke 23, Jesus prayed for the people that put him on the cross. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The very people who nailed him onto the cross, he prayed for. He gave us an example of what we should be doing. And then he told us to do it. We should be praying for those who we don't want to pray for because God told us to do it. If we are on God's side, as we should be, then we should want to see our enemies repent, not fall. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be if Xi Jinping were to get saved and to lead a revival in the country of China? That's much better than them failing economically. Right? Can you imagine if Vladimir Putin were to get saved? I bet you that big war that's going on wouldn't be as big of a deal after that, would it? And that leads to the next point. Praying for our Nineveh is good for everybody involved. It leads to freedom from sin, the emancipation from sin. But it also leads to, as the Bible says in 2 Timothy, a peaceable life. If our leaders are following the Lord, then our life becomes easier as well. We can actually see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's the story of Manasseh. Okay? Manasseh was basically the most wicked king that has ever been seen in Judah. He was so wicked that 
uh, in the beginning of chapter 33, God had him taken to Babylon, so he couldn't even be in Jerusalem anymore. He was that bad, and he caused that much problem for the nation. However, the last half of the chapter presents a different story. Manasseh, in the last half of 2 Chronicles 33, he repents. If we look in verse number 12, and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Okay, and if we look down at verse number 17, what did Manasseh's new leadership do? Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. Okay, the leadership of Israel changed and repented, and he guided his nation into revival. Okay, there is precedent for this happening before. And this is not the first time. It happened with Manasseh and Israel. It happened with the king of Nineveh and Nineveh. Okay? It can happen for China. It can happen for Russia. And it can happen for America too. You know, 1 Timothy chapter number 2 verses 1 through 4 is not just us praying for our own leaders. It doesn't specify your country in that set of verses. It says, for kings and for all that are in authority. Not American kings, not American politicians, but all the leaders of the nations we don't like. We're to pray for them too. I know, I know that it seems impossible that even the leaders of our own country would repent. Definitely not the leaders of Russia and China, North Korea. Why would they ever repent? But I want to tell you guys something. While we were in Thailand, uh, I worked at a school. Okay, I was their ACE supervisor, and I was able to witness to the kids, and it was wonderful. But being a school, they also had a cook, and they, they cycled through cooks rather quickly. Every couple months, a new cook would come in. One particular cook was a somewhat older woman, and she could actually speak a decent amount of English. And so because of that, I would purposely talk to her whenever I went to lunch, and I would tell her about the Lord. And one day, I noticed that she looked especially sad. She was normally a pretty upbeat person, but that day she was pretty sad. And I asked her why. She told me her sister was dying of leukemia. Now, she could not, she did not know that word in English, but I was able to work it out. And she said the doctors had stopped giving her sister blood because they said she was a lost cause. And so they just sent her home to die. As soon as I heard that, it made me extremely sad and anxious. The cook is Buddhist, as is 95% of the country of Thailand. And so it seemed highly unlikely that her sister was saved. And so I kept thinking about it all day I talked to Maggie about it, and I really felt a strong burden to try and witness to this woman before she passed. I noticed my boss was walking around school, and I wanted him there so he could translate, because her English was pretty good, but not good enough for this kind of conversation. And so I asked him to translate for me as I talked to her. 
he agreed to do that. And I asked the cook for a deeper understanding of her sister's situation. And after she told me about it, I asked if we could talk to her about Christ. She said no. Because her, her sister's husband was a very strong Buddhist and would never allow us to do that. That was somewhat discouraging. So I asked if instead we could give her some tracks in Thai that she could read. She said that was not an option either because her sister has actually been in a coma for over a year, dying of leukemia in a coma. She was going that weekend to see her sister to say goodbye. I had quite an internal struggle. I wanted to ask her if, if I could pray for her sister to come out of her coma. But I knew with just a time of days, if God decided not to bring her out of the coma, then that would look very bad on Christianity. And so I struggled with asking. I finally decided I would step out by faith and do it. So I handed her some tracks in time, and I told her I would pray for her sister to wake up from her coma before she died. Over the weekend, my father and I prayed a lot. On Monday, came around. I went to school and was teaching and I actually avoided the cook because <laughs> I was afraid if I go talk to her, what's, what's going to happen? Her sister's passed and everything's going to look bad. I finally worked up the courage to go talk to her. And she said over the weekend her sister had come up out of her coma. I asked her if she'd given the tracks to her sister and she said she had. Two weeks later, her sister passed away. I do not know if she got saved or not. However, I do know that God wanted her to and woke her up from her coma to be able to give her the gospel before she died. If God can bring someone out of a year-long coma, do you think he might be able to change the heart of a politician? I do. If God can bring someone out of a year-long coma, maybe he can even change the heart of a, of a dictator. He's got the power. God wants to see all come to know him as Savior. Not just Americans. Not just Filipinos, not just people from the UK, but all. That includes the leaders of our country that we can't stand. That includes the opposing political party, whatever it may be for you. That includes the nations we consider our enemies. God wants us to pray for their salvation. And in closing, each of us needs to learn to pray for our personal minimum. That one person or place you just don't want to see come to Christ. We need to repent of that and pray about it. Because God does to come to Christ. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you so much, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and that you died on the cross for our sins. Help us, Lord, to realize that we need to pray for the sins of those we don't like and for the sins of those we think are unredeemable. Help us, Lord, to have a little bit of the love that you have for the entire world. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Thailand, we don't 
uh, do invitations. That's, a, that's an American thing. So I'm not going to have an invitation today. But I do want us all to think. Okay? Who is it that you don't want to see saved? And pray for them.